praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with clashes of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath, let everything that hath breath, let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Ephesians 6, verses 10, 11, and 12. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come to you once again with these glorious words in our hearts. We know that these words are written unto us who live at the end of the ages. So at a time like this, when men argue that there is no devil, when men argue that there is nothing like the spiritual realm, we can come to this book and be edified. So Lord, we ask you to show us your glory. Show us your glory, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. We have been looking at these words. And last week, we looked at what the world says about the spiritual realm. This book was written to the Ephesians, the Christians in Ephesus. Ephesus is in Asia Minor. Today is in Turkey. Some of us in this church have been to Ephesus. We have been to this particular church. What I mean, the ruins of this church in Ephesus. We were at the tomb of the Apostle John, where he was buried in Ephesus. The Apostle Paul writes to these Christians so that they can be edified, so that they can be, so that they can know who they are, and so that they can fight the good fight of faith. From chapter 1 to chapter 3, this book, the Apostle deals with the doctrines. He tells them who they are as Christians and how they became Christians. And he tells them the benefits of becoming Christians. All of this, he puts them in the form of a doctrine. How you became born again and who you are in Christ. Because there are some of us who do not know who we are in Christ. So the apostle, he writes these letters, to, I mean this letter, this epistle, to these Christians so they can stand their ground, they can be who they are, lest they become like the slaves who are freed, but they still have the slave mentality. They are free, but when they see their masters, they still behave as slaves. 
So the apostle tells them who they are and how they became who they are. It is important for you to know how you became who you are today. That you are not who you are today by any work that you have done. That who you are today is brought about by the power of God. It is God himself that has made you who you are. And because God has made you who you are, nobody, I say nobody, nothing, absolutely nothing. The apostle Paul says, I am persuaded that nothing, that nothing can change it. Because it is God himself that made you who you are. It is not subject to you. If it depends on you, you can change tomorrow. But it is God. You see the beauty of the gospel. It is God that did it himself. Why? Most of us don't know. But it is God. Then from chapter 4 to chapter 6, the apostle now tells them the meaning, the application of what he has been telling them. Because of who you are and because of how you became who you are, then this is how you have to live. This is how you have to live. If before, you steal, he's saying, because stealing is the work of darkness. He says, now, you can stop stealing. You have the power. If you were obsessed, if you have ever smoked before, or alcoholics, they say, well, I cannot stop. But what the apostle is saying, now, you have the power. To say no to what you don't want to do. Before, you could not say no. You could not say no to sin. You could not say no to adultery. You could not say no to fornication. You could not say no to stealing. You could not say no to lying. But now, you can say no to all of these things. So from verse 4, from chapter 4 to 6, he talks about the application of doctrine. In other words, the application of who you are and how you became who you are. The application of that particular fact. So he now tells them, now you can live the Christian life. Now. You are no longer under the law. Now, you can obey the law. To be under the law, it means you are still lying. You are still doing all of those things. You are a slave to the law. You are under the law. But now, you are no longer under the law. You are above the law. You know, when Christians say, well, I'm no longer under the law, but you are still lying. You are under the law. You are under the law. That's the meaning. If you say you are no longer under the law, then you are above the law. You see, God is not under the law. So, he does not steal. He does not lie. Because he's above it. I haven't told them that this is the way you now live as a Christian. This is the Christian way. Just as it were, just before graduation, he now calls them back. He says, come. That's the finally that you see. Finally. He calls them back. He said, there's something more I want to tell you. That the Christian life, you do not live it in a vacuum. It is true. This is who you are, and this is how you became who you are. And I've just told you now to apply it 
this is how you apply it. But I haven't done all that. Now they have graduated. Now, go out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Put into practice what I have just taught. Just as they were moving out of the gate, you say, come back, come back, come back. There's something I want to tell you. You see, the Christian life, you do not live the Christian life in a vacuum. He says there are forces outside there that will not allow you to live the Christian life. And I want, to, I want you to recognize those forces. It is true about who you are. It is true about how you became who you are. But there are forces outside there that will make sure that you don't leave who you are. You don't leave it out who you are. In other words, as a Christian, you say, now, I don't want to steal. How many times have you made that resolution? Don't you see? There are many people on uh, uh, the 31st of December, they make all these resolutions and all that. I'm not going to smoke. I'm not going to see. I'm not going to uh, uh, drink. I'm not going to commit fornication again. Lord, help me this year that we are coming. I must not. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to be involved in that. I'm not going to lie. That thing that happened, I'm not going to. And the next day, in fact, that particular night, the apostle tells them finally, he says, there are forces outside there that will make sure that you don't steal. I mean that you steal. That we make sure that you commit fornication. Even as you go out and you say, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you must do it. You must do it. They will make sure, they will do everything to make sure you disobey the word of God. It is not as simple as that. In other words, to live a righteous life you must fight not to commit fornication. You know, when I was a young man, all young men go through this. Well, you have to chase women. All young men, you go and toast a young lady and all that, and they say no, 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 and you talk to this, you talk to that. I mean, it's like sports. You are toasting everybody. Then you get married, then you have children. Then after some time, you find that the thing is reversing now. And what, what, what do I mean by reversing? You come to a situation that is the men now, is the women now that are toasting you. You find the women are now chasing you and uh, I will catch you. You did wrong for me, eh? I go catch you. I go see where you did wrong. Where you go wrong, go. And then, you know. And you start wondering, what is going on? This is me before I used to be on the offensive. But now, I'm at the defensive. Now that woman, they come. I beg, tell us, I know they, I beg, I beg. I know they, I know they, I know. Ah, I beg. No, 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 no. Tell the woman, I know they. I know they. The apostle is saying, you have to fight, not to lie. You know, there are some Christians who say, well, not be my fault. I don't know when I lie. I don't know. Not be my fault. I don't know when I slap him. We just they talk, I vex, sha. But I don't know when my hand. Just get up, give and slap. Before I know my hand, don't slap him. What this apostle is saying that there are entities there that want you to sin, to commit sin. There are forces there that do not want you to live the righteous life. That for you to live the righteous life, the apostle is saying that you have to do battle. It is not just passive. No, 
do you have to do battle not to steal? Take it. You have not, you have not eaten since morning. I know they take. <laughs> I'm going to never catch you yet. Take that money. Nobody there, they look at you. Nobody, they see you there. Take and go and go and enjoy yourself. I'm not taking it. And they torment you. They taunt you. They, you have to resist. You have to say, no, go. She's available. She's throwing herself on you. Like Joseph fought. Joseph fought, fought, fought. In the process of fighting, I will not do it. It was not just passive. I will not do it until he ended up in prison. I will not do it. Let me just say something in parenthesis. Anytime you win a battle, there's a reward. Anytime. Anytime. You are in this, in the process of living your Christian life, and you win a battle. I'm not lying. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Even if it means me going to the prison. Even if it means losing all that money. I'm not going to lie. Any time you win a battle like that, there's a reward. Joseph said no. That's how he started to the woman, to Potiphar's wife. And he dragged her. By the time he knew it, he was in prison. But from that prison, he became the prime minister of the greatest nation in the world. There's, also, there's always a reward. So this is just the summary. And last week we looked at what the world says because what I'm saying to you now, this apostle's teaching, the world goes against it. The world doesn't believe that there are forces outside there. No. I told you what the world says about it, what the world believes. They don't believe that there's a, there's a spiritual realm there. And strange enough, there are some Christians who don't even believe that there, there's a spiritual realm there. They don't believe in principalities and in powers and all of those things. And, and then you start wondering, a man who believes in the Holy Spirit, of course, it follows that you must believe in the unholy spirit. A man who believes in the Holy Spirit must believe in evil spirit. But strange enough, I, I, don't, I don't get it. Strange enough, you find some Christians, they say, we believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit, but no, they don't believe in the devil. The devil does not exist. So, you see, they are not consistent. A man who is consistent, at least will believe that there is a Holy Spirit, and then you have the unholy spirits. But that's what this apostle is. That's the teaching of this apostle. That to live the Christian life, you must fight to live it. You must fight to be an upright man. It's not just passive. It's just make a lie, make a no lie. Uh, which one I will take now? Tubu, tubu, mercy. This morning, we are going to be, we are going to, Examine the ultimate cause of the present state of the world. And in particular, why we have to fight to live. Let all of us receive it. This teaching of this apostle. That there are forces there. That wants you not to live the Christian life. Receive this fact. is the teaching of the apostle. Because he says there, we looked at it this before, he says, he says, my brethren, finally be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What does wiles mean? It means the trick, the manipulation of the devil. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We saw some of these things before. He said, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. No 
kill you. They want to destroy you if you want to live the Christian life. Ah. In Luke chapter 14, our Lord tells us a parable about a king who went to war without understanding the strength of the enemy and therefore without sufficient resources. Because the king did not study his enemy to know who his enemy is, to know how many soldiers, you don't just go to war. Nations today, before they go to war, they send spies and all that to determine you must know the nature and the power of your enemy, of who you are fighting. Because this battle, there are some people, I said that last week, who say that, well, I will not be involved in this battle. They go and make some covenant with the devil. They talk to the devil. I will not attack you. I will not uh, uh, fight you. Just leave me alone. I've seen Christians. My wife and I, we've been in prayer meetings where immediately you say, you take authority. I take authority over. Some people will just step. They will just step out and look somewhere else. Immediately you say, you take authority over every foul spirit from Peter. No, no, no. I'm not fighting the devil. They'll tell you. But the devil is fighting you. Whether you like it or not. Whether you know it or not. Whether you are prepared. Whether you make a covenant. The, the devil is a covenant breaker. He's a liar. He disrespects anybody. You cannot make arrangement with him. You cannot tell the devil, wait me at the NRA junction and you find him there. The devil is irresponsible. He has no word. He does not keep a word. When you say the word, the word of God, what is the word of God? The truth. When you say the word, the word stands. Heaven and earth will pass away, but not one judge of the word. It is constant. It is stable. You can rest on it. You can take the word to the market and buy merchandise. The word of God. But the devil. So you must study your enemy. Luke 14, 31, 33. You'll find it there. The king who went to war without the parable and he was discomfited without knowing the strength Unpreparedness is utter folly, according to our Lord. You must prepare. You must know the enemy. So the purpose of this teaching, the purpose of this teaching, is not just because I want to preach. The, the resurrected Christ gave the fivefold ministries. And these fivefold ministry, they are a, for a purpose. They are well defined what they should do. And they are five, not six, not seven. When I hear some people say, the Lord called me to make people rich. Where is that? Where is that in the Bible? Oh, my ministry is deliverance. I don't know where that is in the Bible. Every child of God can do deliverance. Every child of God. In this church, we do deliverance when the occasion arises. Every child of God is there in the Bible. You tread on scorpions. In my name, you will cast out demons. It's not for only uh, papas and bishops and all of that. No. If you are a child of God. The fivefold ministry. And what is the purpose of this fivefold ministry? Each one has a function for the edification of the body of Christ so that the body, so that the body of Christ will be wise, so that he will do. There's no other ministry to make money. There's nothing like that in the Bible. It is the Lord your God that maketh thee to be wealthy. It's not by teaching. There are men who have PhD in business. 
And they are as far as the church rat. And look at Chief Okonkwo. Who did he go to school? He has built houses all over Wari. All over Onicha. Across the bridge. He owns everything. And he didn't go to school. And then you see one pastor who was a, who was a mechanic before. Who was a carpenter. There's nothing wrong in being a carpenter. There's nothing wrong in being a carpenter. Who we'll stand in front of a church and is teaching men who have master's degree, PhD in business. He's teaching them how to buy chairs. You ask me, is it not mockery? Is it not foolery? Is that folly? And then you see the men who are taking, uh, who are PhD in business, they are taking notes. And I'm asking myself, they passed the carpenter, went to read uh, one of these books in Get Rich Quick, small, small books. And then I come to the church and I see the man. That's why I master's degree, PhD, that one, and all that. They are taking notes. And Chief Okonkwo is there, is laughing at them. Taking notes. Well, how you have been taking notes from how many years ago? Said so you are a professor, you are a don. You know, dons are dons. The first thing we have to do is to know the strength of and the power of the enemy that is set against us. We have to know. A man must study his enemy if he wants to defeat him in battle. Failure to do this might result in defeat. You must study your enemy. You will be defeated and become slave to him. He will defeat you and capture you. That's why many of us are in sin. The devil will defeat you. And after defeating you, after messing you up several times, you know, sometimes some of these drug barons, what do they do? If they want to put you under them, if they want to subjugate you and put you under them, they catch you, they force you to take cocaine. They take the crack and force it down your nose and make you and get you shocked. After that, <laughs> you must always want it. You must always you come and meet him. You become his slave. After that, you're on the street looking for cocaine. Looking for cocaine. That's what the devil does. He will get you involved in sin. Force you. Defeat two or three times. Then after that, you are hooked to it. You know, you know there are some people who say, I can't stop stealing. Did you steal when you were, as a baby, were you stealing in your mother's womb? Some people cannot stop fornication. My body, they make me one kind. How? How they make you one kind? Were you fornicating in your mother's womb as teenagers? That's what happens. The devil will make you taste it once or twice. And after that, you cannot get yourself out of it. You must always, you must always do it. You become a slave. A man must study his enemy. Because if he defeats you, you fall. Then you become his slave. It's the law of war. They defeat a whole place, they take all of them as slaves. Then you start working for them. Then they tell you, go there, you go, come here, you come. Do this, you do that. You cannot say no any longer because you were defeated. You were defeated. It's also a spiritual law. You become his slave. So this morning, let us look very quickly at these forces. And let us start with the terms that the apostle used. The first is the devil. The apostle says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We must start with him because according to the teaching of the scripture, 
He is the chief of all the powers that are set against us. He is their leader. Many names are ascribed to him. Here, he is called the devil. That is the term that is commonly used in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The devil. But there are many other names ascribed to him. Beelzebub, Belial, the evil one, the wicked one, the strong man armed. Hey! The strong man armed. You see those two, we'll come to it later. It's not only that he's strong, he's armed. And so on. These names are used in order that we may understand something about the character and the nature of the devil. The scripture makes it clear that we must think of the devil in a personal way. It is wrong to think that the devil is a power or a force. You know, there are some people who make the same mistake with the Holy Spirit. They think the Holy Spirit is a force, it's an influence. They don't know that the Holy Spirit is a person. What I mean by a person is that he's a distinct person. He's an individual. He, he's a personality. It's not just a breeze that is blowing. There are sometimes we even think that the Holy Spirit is a kind of liquid. Feel me, Holy Spirit. That is a liquid that you can pour. You pour the Holy Spirit. Sometimes because of the way that we use the terms. So, all of this leads us to that error to think that the Holy Spirit is not a person just the way you are. Distinct. You have a character. You feel. You like. You love. You know what belongs to you and all that. You reason. You are logical. You are rational. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is not just a wind. The, the Bible is true. It uses some symbolism to describe the Holy Spirit. Wind wine, water, and so on. But he is a person. So the devil too is a person. Just as I said, if you believe in the Holy Spirit, if you know that the Holy Spirit is a person that knows you, just as the way you see me, ah, this is Tali. This is my pastor. And you introduce me to, to your friend. Please meet my pastor. That's the way the Holy Spirit is. It's not a thing. It's not an it. So we must start from there to realize that the devil is a person. But I haven't said that. He's a person, but he's a superhuman personality. He's a superhuman. He's above man. You cannot fight with him. He's not interested in respecting you. On your own, that's what I mean. You cannot fight with him. So he's not interested in making a covenant with you. Not fight me, I know fight you. He's not interested in that. Because anyway, it's like a small boy coming to make a, a covenant with me. Uh, make we not fight, make we settle. Because uh, if we not settle, if we do something, we go. <laughs> uh, this is a small boy, five-year-old boy talking to me. That let, 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 let's settle, let's make, I don't need to settle. Because if I hold, hold that to your ear and squeeze it, ah, mama, 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 mom, I don't need to do that. This superhuman is bigger than man, stronger than man, greater than man. Yet, at the same time, he is not divine. He is not God. Amen, somebody. 
It's not God. The fact that is bigger than me. There are many people in the Federal Republic of Nigeria who are bigger than me. But at the same time, they are not God. The devil is not God. You know, there used to be an ancient heresy, and there are some people who believe in it, some of these people in the cults. They thought that there were two gods controlling human affairs, the positive God and the negative God. And that is what you call dualism, dual two. One big God which is in charge of the positive and one small God which is in charge of the negative. They say the action and reaction. That anywhere you find positive, you must find negative. You know, see battery. You get positive. Eh? So now so the thing be. Yes, now so it be. You know, see current. You get positive, you get negative. There are some people who taught that. And they say, well, the positive, you get power small. Should I create the whole world? But some of them, some people still think that that, oh, it's the negative that is stronger. But the Bible teaches that whereas the devil is superhuman, he is not divine. He is less than divine. He is a created being. One, the almighty God created the devil. The apostle Paul says, you need to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. So I want us to I want to I want to remind ourselves that as I said. The devil is a personality. I want to say that to you. And I also want to say it to you that though he's a personality, he's far, far, far from being God. It's like you have two mountains. It's like you are standing 500 miles away and there are two mountains. One big one and one very small one. Because you are standing far, because the difference, the, the distance between me and the devil is so far, you think that the distance between the devil and God is the same if you are standing from a distance and watching the two of them. But the distance from the devil to God is infinite. Did you get what I just said? It's infinite. There's nothing to compare it at all. There is absolutely nothing to compare. I just, want, I just want to emphasize that point so that you will know. Now, I want us to talk about this element of power. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, the power of the devil. In Ephesians 2.2, 2, the devil is referred to as the prince of the power of the air. All what I'm saying to you now, I'm trying to reveal to you who your enemy is so that you will know. In Ephesians 2, 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air. What the word prince means, the leader. It means the leader, the chieftain. And in this Ephesians 2, it continues by saying, the spirit that now walketh in the children of, obedience, of disobedience. He said, the spirit that now walketh in the children, I want you to notice those words. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. When you see the disobedience, people who disobey the word of God, people the world system, as it is, sin, revelry, homosexuality, abortion, they don't want to hear about God. They are on their own. 
He said, this is the spirit that works in them. Go and do it. Go and steal. It's okay. You are hungry. Go on. Uh, uh, you are homosexual. You are born like that. It's okay. Whatever you like, go on. You want to sleep with dead bodies in the cemetery? Oh, go on. It's okay. You want to uh, sleep with rats? It's okay. Go on. With animal bestiality? Go on. The spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. The apostle uses a similar expression concerning him in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, where he talks about the God of this world. It's the same thing. The God of this world. The way you see the world behave, the way they talk, disrespect, the way they behave and all that and you are wondering. Hate, murder, all of these things that you see is happening in the world now. He's the leader. He's the one behind all of this. He says in this 2 Corinthians 4, 4, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world. When he says the God of this world, I'm using the, the small g of this world system. The way you see the world is now, with all the wickedness, with all the revelry, with all the abuse, and all that. He is the prince. He is behind all of this. You see, all of this gives us some impression of his might, his authority, and his power. I want you to stand aside. As a child of God, you are standing aside, just as I said, the Apostle Paul has told you who you are and how you became who you are and he has told you how to apply this and in the process of now you want to go into the world, you are now born again, you are now a new creature, I want to live a new life and the Apostle puts you at the door. See the world the way it is. You see that one abusing that? You see that one raping that? You see that this is? That, that is him. The God of this world. The spirit that walketh. The spirit that motivates all of these actions in the children. And the children of, of disobedience. I want you to take another term used by our Lord himself. In Luke eleven twenty one to 22. He calls him the strong man armed. In Luke Luke 11, 21 to 22. Our Lord describes him as a strong man armed. He's comparable to a very powerful and strong man armed. He said, who keepeth his goods in peace? He keepeth his goods in peace. In other words, when he has introduced you to a particular sin, when he has introduced you to murder, there are some people who are serial mothers, serial fornicators, housewives, serial adulterers, husbands, serial adulterers. After he has introduced you to, to all of this, he keeps you in peace. He tells you, just go on living like that. I don't want to hear any problem from you. Go on committing adultery. You sleep with this woman. Sleep with, just go on like that. It's a system like that. It's, it's an habit. So you have whole nations, you have whole communities, all of them, they go on like that. You see principalities in, in a particular geographical area, all the ejors, they must do like that. They must behave like that. Peace, tradition, familiar spirit, all of them, so we they do them, so we they do them. Have you heard people say, so we they do them, that this is our tradition? All Shakiris, all Igbos, they behave alike. Now, so he keeps them in peace. It's a system. All of you continue to steal. It's all right. Just make sure you steal. If there's anybody who does not want to steal, that person will be punished. Did you hear what I just said? In the Bible, if you steal, you'll be punished. But for these children of disobedience, if you don't steal, you will see, you will be punished. 
Lest the demon that is in charge says, that's the day you are born again. There's one here that has, uh, uh, that is rising up. There was no money. No, I, I, he saw money and he refused to take it. Huh? This is the demon reporting to, to the devil. He not take her. He refused to steal. Yeah. Or maybe he's just a, a moral person. Okay, now. Set him up. Put the money in a place where there's nobody. You know, some people like to steal, but they don't want to be caught. Maybe he's ashamed of being caught. But now, set him up. Nobody. Put the money there. Okay, I'll go try him, sir. I'll go try him, Oga. And then he will set you up. And they put the money there. Nothing at all. Nobody is watching. No camera. Take him. And then you say no. Ah. ah. Then trouble has started. Oh. Trouble has started. He will go and report you. There's one in our midst. I set him up as you said. He refused. I think that he's born again. Huh? Then the fight will start with you. And this is the fight. Young Christians, they get into when they are born again. And there, there are some people who make some kind of decision for the Lord. It's like the seed that is planted on the surface of the ground. Yes, I've had the gospel. It's with me. And they get up. Yes, now I'm born again. They are not. Because whom God has planted, nobody can reap. Nobody can uproot. Yes, I'm born again. And then when they go home, they are still. Uh, they will still. No resistance. And all that. By the time you know, I beg this Christian thing, I know, I know fit, I know fit. Ah, I know fit, I know fit. Because it's a billionaire today by stealing. Now, if I know still, I go poor. Amen. In Revelation 3, 4, he's called a great red dragon. A dragon conjures a picture of might and power. Revelation 12, verses 3 to 4. You see it, where it's called a great dragon. A dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. You see, it conjures power. And in Revelation 21, we find the dragon referred to as that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. These descriptions, they convey ideas, not only of subtlety, but of strength and of great power. Indeed, it is clear from the Bible that the power of the devil is second only to that of God. Having glanced at the power of the devil, let us go on to consider what he does, just in few words. What is his purpose? Now, what is the purpose of the devil. You see, the very words that are used to designate him and to describe him, they answer the question. They answer the question of what his purpose is. You can know his purpose by these very words that are used to describe him. The meaning of the word devil. What does the word devil mean? The meaning of the word devil is a traducer. To traduce means to speak maliciously and falsely, to slander, to defame. What does that mean, to speak, to speak wickedly? That is his purpose. I want you to, then let's go to the second one because I'll take the two together. Then, the meaning of the word Satan, it means adversary. 
adversary. What does that word adversary mean? It means this is somebody that is in opposition to what you want to do. It's in opposition to the type of life that you want to live. The adversary is saying, I must stop him from living a Christian life. I will stop him. This one, I will make sure that he steals. This is your adversary. Because you are coming out now, the apostle has told you who you are and what you are, and he said, because of what you are, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of God. That is the doctrine. Therefore, because your body is the temple of God, you must not join your body to the body of an idol. Because you are a child of God, you must never steal because you are no longer under the law. So this is who you are now. But this Satan, he comes and he says, you must steal. You must steal. This is you now coming out as a child of God. I'm not going to steal as from today. Sin will no longer dwell in my mortal body. I will destroy sin. I will mortify the works of the devil in my flesh. I will destroy it. And then the devil said, destroy who? Destroy who you want to destroy. Who you want to destroy? I'll be your mate. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Devil, as I said, means to, to defame. It means to speak maliciously. What does that mean? He's the one that goes, he's, he has lied. This man that says he's a Christian, he's a liar. He's a liar. You see what it is to, <laughs> you see, you, you see what it is to live as a worldly man. Because the devil will report you. Have I told you once that if a child of God goes to steal with an unbeliever, you people plan that you go and boggle one bank. While you have taken the money and you are running away with it, the unbeliever, the devil will make sure that the unbeliever gets home. But you as a child of God, Maybe that. <laughs> Where you are hiding in that gutter, eh? he will go and bring the police. See, I'm not in the so. Not in the so. He will defame you. Pastor sleep with church woman. The whole, the whole Nigeria will scatter. Pastor. Eh? Whereas, president sleep with a uh, uh, a country woman. <laughs> the president of Nigeria sleeps with a Nigerian woman. Uh -huh. Who you want to make you sleep with before? <laughs> Who you want to make you sleep with? Huh? The day pastor will sleep with your own church woman. Hey, 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 traduce a devil. He will come. Hey! Top news, breaking news. Everybody. Hey, which pastor be that? Now, this pastor, pastor for Mother House. <laughs> That's the meaning. Check, go home and you check that word. The meaning of devil. You see, traduce, the traducer means to speak maliciously and falsely, to slander, to defame. Amen. And these are the actual expressions that are used in the scripture concerning him. He's called the accuser of the brethren. To accuse is one of his chief activities. Nobody you say you're born again. Why you go lie? Nobody you talk so. Are you not born again? Why did you go and commit adultery? Why did you go and steal? Why are you using the system of my people? Why are you on my side now? You live in GRA and you are coming to uh, uh, which place? Ihara to come and buy a kara. 
Why don't you go to shop right in your area? Why are you coming to my area? Why are you using the way of life of my people? Accuser. Quickly. And then you'll be shocked. You lie. Others will lie. That does not mean that is normal. Others mean unbelievers will lie. That is normal. What do you want to make unbeliever do before? Make you tell the truth. If you're telling the truth, it means he's, uh, he's like uh, an Iyara boy trying to, trying to do Aje. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. So, the Iyara boy will speak like an Iyara boy. Are there your brethren here? <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So, he will accuse you straight. That is the meaning of the accuser of the brethren because you are now stepped out based on the teaching of the apostle. You have now stepped out. You want to live as he has told you now. The child of God does not lie. You want to live and the devil is for you. Make us young. He will be following you. He's following you. Especially the demon, that demon of lying. He's following you. Then the day you just uh, mopo catch you. Are you the one? <laughs> Walai. <laughs> Walai. Ask all of them here. I've, in fact, this is my first time of being to worry. Whereas, I, I, in fact, I don't live in worry at all. You see, the moment you do that, huh, he's accusing you. He's accusing you. And who is he accusing you to? Of course, accusing you to the Lord, accusing you to the authorities and all that, accusing you to, to everybody. He's telling everybody, look at this man, he's, he's lying. He's a liar. And then, the Holy Spirit is grieved. The child of God is grieved. He's going on to, to cry because he has been accused of lying. The accuser of the brethren. Why? So, that you cannot live the Christian life. You see how this is connected to sanctification? You see that to be sanctified, to live a life of sanctification, what I mean by sanctification, you have been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, now you have to live as a Christian, to be conformed to the image of Christ. I want to be like Jesus. For you to be like Jesus, you go fight. And one of the guys that you have to fight is this man that's, that is called the accuser of the brethren. The apostle wants you to know that's how he behaves. He will defame you. He will give you a bad name. He will torment you and all that. He will watch you if you use their system. Amen. He's also referred to as the tempter. He comes to us to mislead and to delude us. He will tempt you. He will suggest to you. Remember when we are describing the word wrestle. He will tell you all the reasons why you must break the law so that you can be put under it. The breaker of the law is the man that is under the law. And this is the summary of what he's doing. You find it in Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And then in Revelation 13, 7, we read that the devil makes war against the saints. Now, is this not important for you to know all of these things? You see, is this not important? That's why these epistles are written. That's why. That's why we studied the book of Romans. That's why this Ephesians, if we had time, we studied Ephesians. But you see, I, didn't, I just took this last part, which is uh, chapter 6 to the end. I took it because we are studying the book of Romans. And in the book of Romans, some, most of these things that the apostle talks about 
in Ephesians 1 to 3, which is the doctrine, he also spoke about these things in the book of Romans for you to know. You see, there's no place here on me coming here this morning and asking you and teaching you on how to make money. How to make money. How to sow cloth. How to sow this. How to do that. Is that my duty? Did you think in the days of the apostle that there was no fashion, that there were, there were no banks, that there was no economy? You see, the, why the world is going its own way? God is having a certain agenda. Amen, somebody. God, the people of God are going that narrow way. That's, that's, that's why he calls it the narrow way. Because if I'm a man in the world, if I want to do something, uh -huh, I do it anyway. You do the exams first. You know green pass. You know fit pass. Naturally, you know what to do. Expo. You do the expo. It didn't work. You go and meet uh, whoever is there. Forge the certificate. Arrange it. You try that, in ugly work, you kill the, uh, kill the principal. <laughs> kill, the, kill the man or kill the registrar and find your brother put there. That one doesn't work, uh, take bomb, destroy the whole, the whole, destroy everywhere. That one doesn't work, destroy the whole of Nigeria. Take it over. There's no limit to what you can do. It's a broad way. Anything can go so long you can do it. That's how it works. That's how it works. But the child of God is led by the Holy Spirit. Turn left. Turn right. Stand there. You stand there for 10 years. Okay, now. That Pharaoh is dead. The man that is obstructing you is dead. Move now. Then you move. It's not talking about money. If it's money, ha, trust God. There are some of you here, now the way I'm looking at some of you here. If I divide 20, 20 million to everybody now, everybody 20 million, 20 million, 20 million. And I say come back in three months. Half of the church will be in Obodo. Half of the church through Libya, some will die. <laughs> because forgiving 20 million, 20, 20 million each. Some will die. Some will have degrees, HIV, AIDS, all kinds of degrees they will have. Some, that degree of amputation. Some will be amputated after what did happen? Went to buy a car, went to a party, and all that drank, and they were driving accident. And they don't be small accident, so they had to amputate one leg. Some one eye. Is is money the solution of the Christian life? No. What the apostle is saying is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. He said, but against principalities, against powers. He said, these are the guys that you must recognize. Amen, somebody. If not, if it's a question, a man can be happy with small money. Maybe there are some ladies here. You get married to a prince that has a big palace and they put you there. Two weeks. The first day you come, oh, this palace is fine. Swimming pool, all kinds of things. All everything you find there. Big, sprawling, how many acres of land that is there. First one month. After that, it will become boring. Many women know that. All that opulence, wealth, it will become nothing. 
you are not seeing the man that you married, but you are living in a palace. Many women will say, no, I don't want this. And as I'm talking now, there are some women here, and I will say, Tali, try me, I go one time. Tali, I do I want to take man do. Palace like that. Hey, Tali, if I did there, I don't go want to see anything. Just leave me there. Make the man just go. Forget me there. I go happy. No. You, what you are talking now is, is the mentality of a poor woman. Amen, somebody. Because there's something. Amen, somebody. We are people of God. Amen, somebody. If it's just about money, then Jesus would not have come. If it's about money, if all of these things is just for us, now I'm born again, so I can make money. If that is the reason, Jesus would not have come. The Lord would have just said, all of you here become millionaires. And you become millionaire overnight. Amen. But the reason why Jesus came, 1 John 3, 8. The Lord himself, the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of who? Of the devil. That's why Jesus came. To destroy the works of the devil. What I'm preaching now is to help you to mortify. What does the word mortify mean? It's to destroy, to kill, to annihilate, to scatter, to make null and void the works of the devil. The child of God is a man that must defeat the devil. You have the power already. The power of the Holy Spirit dwells in you to do this. And so, the word of God says now, child of God, born again, you know who you are and how you became who you are. You know the power that worketh in you. Now, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for the power of God worketh in you. Both to will and to do of whose pleasure? God's pleasure. Not the devil's pleasure. Not what the devil will tell you to do. Not what the devil will manipulate you to do. Not what the devil will force you to do until you become his slave. The child of God can never be a slave to the devil. The child of God is a man that will stand, filled with the Holy Ghost and tell the devil, I am not going to do this. Get behind me, Satan. Amen. Shall we rise in the presence of God and give glory to him?